acceleration like that they cause doesn't depend on mass. Um, maybe discuss for a little a little bit. Was it? I'm not sure. So, oh, I saw. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, I'm so, well, but, but, but to your credit, right? Uh, people, if you just sort of thought of like light as being massless, you would think it has no momentum. But actually, relativity, light does have momentum, even though this is zero. Energy is not zero. So then, uh, this P, which stands for momentum, is not zero. So that's why solar sails actually work. Okay. Uh, that's it's not really obvious. Pressure. Yeah. So this is a very strange concept that light actually. Uh, this, okay, I hear that everything's died down. Uh, does anyone have any suggestions for, for such a force uh, that doesn't depend on mass? Uh, whose acceleration that it causes doesn't depend on mass? You? Tension. Tension. Um, that's interesting. Um, I would say. Um, uh, I suppose, but I guess, like, not quite in a way, right? Like, if you have the same amount of tension uh, acting on two different bodies, yes, it is true that they both feel the same force. But consequently, the heavier one will be accelerated less, right? You see what I mean? So, so not quite, but, but good, good try. What about you? Oh, 
that's also an interesting guess. So it is, so magnetism is very interesting in the fact that magnetism actually causes things to arc. It never acts in the direction that something is moving, as it turns out. Um, but actually, it only, it really, if you, if you get down to the bottom of it, actually only depends on things like charge, um, which, which as we see is like not the same thing as mass. It, it actually does depend on how heavy things are. And this does matter um, if you guys ever do something like chemistry or something, uh, there, there are apparatuses where you basically have like electric and magnetic fields that sort of like uh, cause particles that to go in like a circle, and then the farther, the bigger their circle they go, like uh, like determines the chemical composition of the material you put in. So actually, uh, it does depend on mass. You can tell particles apart uh, by their mass uh, with magnetism. Uh, any other guesses? Uh, yes. So. If you recall the beginning of this class on the first lecture, uh, I encouraged you to uh, accept the idea that um, uh, fictitious forces are not actually fictitious, right? If I put you in a car, right, and then I slam the brakes, and you have like a, like a mug in one hand and a bowling ball in the other, which one accelerates faster? Do you understand the scenario? Which one will accelerate faster? If, if, if I slam the brakes. Will they accelerate the same? Yes. Why? Because mass doesn't matter. I mean, if, yeah, so if you go to like the ground frame, what you're really seeing is that they're both just going straight because of Newton's like first law, right? And so like fundamentally, like if you're in that situation, you're in a car, right? Everything goes forward at the same rate, right? And so um, really it's fictitious forces. Um, I don't like this word, but unfortunately, I'm just going to use it. Fictitious forces. And so we've discovered something interesting. And in the case of fictitious forces, it is really no wonder that they don't depend on mass, because if you really sort of think about it, right, it, it doesn't really make sense. Like, they're not real forces in that sense. Right? They're just because things are going in a straight line, and everything that um, has mass goes forward in a straight line in this way. It doesn't really make sense why it would depend on mass. Yes? So for example, like, have you ever been in a car and somebody slams the brakes and you sort of get pushed forward? Right? That's a fictitious force. Right? Because somebody in the car, because you might think you're being tugged forward by something invisible, right? but really what somebody from the ground would be seeing is that the car is slowing down and then you're just going straight. And then the car is sort of exerting a force like the seatbelt is sort of pulling you back and so you feel that. You see what I'm saying? So it's like the Like the centrifugal force is another example of right. a fictitious force. So yeah, force so yes. Feel like if, you're, if you're on a carousel and you're feeling yourself being like pushed out of the carousel, if you sort of get what I mean, that's like, it's a result of, from, from the person standing on the ground, it looks like it's a result of you wanting to move in a straight line, and the carousel constantly pull, pulling you into a circle. Right, so another example is if you have like a bucket, I don't know if you, you might want to try this, you can take a bucket and sort of fill it with water and then swing it around your head, it will actually stay in the bucket, it will not fall at you. The mm. reason, reason why is because it's trying to go straight, but like you're pulling it in a circle, so it's actually feeling like, like it's going straight, but then you're pulling it down, so it's actually getting pushed against the side of the, okay. the bucket. But that doesn't mean that, it doesn't, it doesn't look like a real force, is what I'm saying. And so I'm going to not sugarcoat it. This is the basic premise of general relativity. Okay, it's pretty insane. Um, gravity is a fictitious force. I don't know if you guys believe me. Uh, it's pretty insane. Uh, I don't. I didn't really believe it either. Uh, but let me let's consider uh, one of Einstein's famous thought experiments. Of course, I don't know if elevators existed in his time, but they exist in ours, so we're going to make full use of uh, those. Suppose you knock out, and then in our, uh, in our uh, uh, endless generosity, we put you in an elevator, and like just close it, so you like don't know where you are. So then you, uh, so then you wake up, and it turns out that you're, you're like in the elevator, but you're like floating. Like, you don't feel any gravity. Um, where do you think you are? In the air. In the air. Do we know that we're on Earth? 
you have no idea. You, I mean, you're not dead. You have oxygen, but sort of like it could be sealed in there. So like, so you could be falling. That's true. Yes. You could be falling. You could be in space. Exactly. You could be in space. Any way to tell? Is there any way to tell? So you, so you could either be falling, in which case you would be accelerating, or you could be in space. So is there any way to tell? Could you like throw something and see if you go in the opposite direction? That's true, but that actually, like, that actually, if you throw something, that's true you, because of concentration momentum, you'd be pushed back. But that would happen in both cases. Yeah. Have, yeah. have you ever seen like people in parachutes, like, or like skydiving or something? If they throw objects, they're going to move slow. Uh, let me let me pose to you another question. Suppose that uh, I knock you out again. <laughs> then you wake up and you're actually like standing there, and you actually feel you drop something. It falls at 9.8 meters per second squared, right? And you're like, okay, uh, looks like I'm on Earth, right? Well, what actually could be happening, you might not know, is suppose there's some rocket below that's sort of like shooting, like that's like sort of like thrusting, uh, like like producing a thrust at exactly 9.8 meters per second. Then you would feel an inertial force similar to like like how like a copy gets pushed out of your hand. Uh, you would feel an inertial force that would pull things down at 9.8 meters per second, but really would be an inertial force. I'm glad Earthers actually believe this. <laughs> yeah. I hate to give credence to the, to the argument, but um, <laughs> like they, if, if your Earth is flat, how do you explain gravity? Well, they say the flat Earth is just accelerating upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared, and that explains why we have gravity. It's actually remarkable. So, so I pose this question again. Is there any way to tell? You can't actually feel it. The answer is actually, okay, so there's something called the equivalence principle. Uh, and what it says is um, no. End of class. No. <laughs> um, but um, but this is very important, right? It basically says, you know, gravity is a fictitious force. You cannot tell the difference between gravity and uh, not gravity, uh, and you know, there's no way to tell basically uh, between uh, gravity and acceleration. Just pretty, pretty insane. Right? It's a pretty, pretty large claim. Um, yeah, and so. Um, before we continue, I would like to sort of get you acquainted with this concept of curvature. I do, I'm going to draw a triangle right now. Let's go back to our eighth grade class. What do these angles add up to? Okay. Yes, that's true. They add up to 180 degrees. Now, suppose, so suppose I did this experiment, right? Suppose I sort of walked in a direction. Then I turned 90, like, like some d number of degrees, right? And then I sort of turned around and walked back to where I started, right? Um, and then I should measure 180 degrees, right? But consider, like, what if I like was really into walking, right? So like, this is the entire Earth, and I started at the North Pole. I sort of walked down <laughs> to the equator, take a 90 degree like angle, sort of walk like like a fourth of the way around the Earth take another 90 degree angle and then walk up to the North Pole. What do these angles add up to? 270. 270. Why not, a, why not 180? Because the curve is curved. It's curved, yeah. Um, and suppose we lived on like a potato chip. This is, <laughs> this is not, fortunately this is a sort of a tortured example. But um, suppose you lived on a potato chip and you sort of walked in a direction that you think is straight then you walk in a different direction, then you walk back, and you measure these angles. Uh, do you think that you would measure more or less than 180 degrees? Less. less. In fact, like, less than 180 degrees. This is the concept of curvature, right? Uh, the idea that, like, another example might just be if you walk in a straight line, you actually end up where you started on the space, right? Uh, and so this is sort of the premise of curvature. And sort of the geometry of, of space time, right? Even if you think that you're moving straight, you will still feel some sort of strain force. 
Um, like, and it, it won't be a real force, right? If you think about it, right? Like, if you take this a uh, huge picture, you'll be like, no, like what you're doing is walking on a space, uh, a curved space time, uh, or something like this. But, but, you know, fundamentally, what's going on? Uh, but fundamentally, what you feel is that like there's some weird force that's causing that's causing because you sort of assume that you're you're flat, right? So you sort of get this effect. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the metric now. How, how does that behave in space time? So I wrote this down, and this thing. Um, Thing is called a metric. Uh, metric. Uh, if you, I'm, by the way, C. I'm just gonna ignore all the C's um, whenever I don't care about them, which is most of the time, um, because they get in the way. But the metric is sort of by metric. You might think of metric system or like like meter or something like this. A metric sort of like is like the, like a root for measurement, right? And so the way this is sort of a measurement of length and space time. And what I'm going to claim to you, right, is that uh, like the metric, which as a reminder, is the literal definition of like lengths in space time. So like the definition of lengths between points, which are points in space time, right? Events, which are points in space time. So the metric itself depends on matter and energy. Right? So your notion of length itself is a function of matter and energy in the universe, right? which is a bold claim, right? Um, and so, without further ado, let's write down Einstein's equations. Well, first of all, let's write down Newton's equations, right? So it is it's true in that, in a way, these equations are very conceptually similar. So let me write it down, and I'll have you guys try and interpret it. These symbols mean the same things as last time, except that this means gravitational field. These are some constants, and this means mass density. So like, you know, the normal constant of density. Can anyone just raise their hand and tell me what this says? What is a minus sign? Like, I, we gave you a key for electromagnetism. These are the same symbols. Uh, does, can anyone tell me what this says? Maybe look back to your notes. Um, if you want to, if you want to look back to it. Part, they can go to the ENM like We wrote down this was this this thing meant something. And yeah, something springs from here. Okay. So the gravitational field springs from mass. Right? And, and in fact, minus the mass. So actually instead of springing from it, like it sort of like drains into there. Right? So the opposite of, of this. Right? So this is sort of like the field, the gravitational field, and then the, the mass term, right? The, the place that tells you where the gravity comes from. Right? This is the structure of this equation. Now that being said, let me show you what Einstein wrote down. I would never have written this down in a million years, but that's why I'm not Einstein. <laughs> so he wrote down this equation. Uh, this, the second term here is controversial. Um, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <coughs> and, and you might think it's kind of elegant, right? You know, it's nice. Um, here's the problem with this. Right? See, these, this mu and this nu, okay, these are actually like indices for equations, right? So actually, there are actually 16 equations here, right? You know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. So there's an equation that looks like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then every number between 0 and 3. And fortunately, some of them repeat, so actually you only have 10. So 10 equations. That's pretty bad, but it, it could be fine. Okay. Uh, but it turns out that this thing right here, this is called the Einstein tensor, is the same thing as this. Uh, okay. And this thing here, and this uh, this thing here, first of all, is this. I really, I really meant it when I said I wouldn't have ever written this down. Oh my god. Oh god, this is really bad. Uh, alpha, alpha, three, three. Uh, and then 
each of these things is the same thing that's happening here, and this thing is uh, R alpha mu alpha nu, just the same thing as adding these three terms together. Where, and I never even told you what R was, so let me tell you what it is, and then you're really going to want to cry. Um, <laughs> can I erase this? Uh, you guys filled out the attendance, right? Where this thing um, is defined to be, and then if you guys are taking calculus, this is a derivative um, of this thing. This is a different derivative. Oh god. Okay. Uh, minus sign. Where this thing is going to be equal to the metric. Do you remember the metric? Yeah, that, that thing, the metric, G, um, times another derivative, times the metric again, times another derivative. Yes, exactly. Uh, times another derivative. And that's it. That's the entire thing. So pretty easy. That's um, it? Um, and, I, and I wrote that down not because anyone ever remembers this, but because, um, well, people do actually, but um, because general relativity is hard. Right? It's very hard to solve general relativity, and in fact, it's still an area of extremely active research. If you become an expert in general relativity, you can do cutting edge physics research today because it's really, really hard. Okay? And you can probably see why. This is basically the people who are in the know about math. It's 10 coupled partial differential equations, all of which are. Uh, can be nonlinear and independent, right? Uh, containing second uh, derivatives in the metric tensor, uh, which is the number, the thing I wrote down above, right? Uh, and yeah, uh, containing like dozens of terms. So that so have fun with that, I guess. Um, but but you know, people are smart and they actually sort of figured stuff out um, smarter than me. And so actually, it turns out that remarkably, right after this was released, people actually solved it. For some, some, somehow, I don't know who has the time for this, but like let's let's look at some consequences of this. Orbits, or, or roughly speaking, the two-body problem, right? Um, so you might recall from the first lecture that this concept of gravitational potential energy, and let's say you have two particles that are separated really far. This one's really, really, really heavy, so it never moves, and it's just this one that's moving, sort of like the Earth or something. It turns out that the gravitational potential energy, U, uh, is related to the distance of separation like in a way that looks like this. And it turns out we can also add on a term, uh, which is sort of like uh, sort of a compensation term for the uh, centrifugal force, like, you know, sort of the rotational force, uh, like in a rotating frame, right? Because you, like, you sort of feel a, a force pushing you outwards. So you can pretend that that's a force. And so in, in, in regular, uh, in regular Newtonian mechanics, what you'll get is a potential that looks like this. And for you chemists out there, this looks kind of familiar. It looks sort of like the force between two two uh, molecules in it. I mean, two atoms in a molecule, a like a, a like a yeah. And so you can see that um, uh, like like if you if you sort of decrease your energy right for a given angle of momentum, you sort of end up like here, like at a constant radius, right, which is sort of like a circular orbit, right. So this is like normal. You can see like if I like sort of push it around, it will sort of slosh around back and forth. And that will correspond to an elliptical orbit where you sort of get closer and farther away from your, your star. You guys see what I mean? Um, now let me show you what it looks like in general relativity. So what are the axes of that? Pardon? Yeah, this is, it, this is just the potential energy. And this is the, the distance between the two particles. So between the sun and the earth. And just recall that like things feel a force in a way that makes them like think of it as hills. Yeah, like right. yeah, you know, that's, as we discussed earlier. Um, I think it was that now. Okay. 
Great. Um, yeah, and I'll show you what it looks like in general relativity. The same, the same concept, right? So you know, general relativity has to agree with Newtonian relativity, uh, Newtonian mechanics in some in some regime. So indeed, it does look like this, and then it goes up as usual, and then sort of goes down to like minus infinity, as it turns out. Um, this this radius here is actually. Uh, uh, G M over C squared. Notice how C is a very big number, so this is going to be really small. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. And so, if you, you can notice first of all that that you have circular orbits, and then you have like orbits that if you go within this certain distance, you just die. Like you don't come back out. Okay. And you might wonder why I drew this dot. Um, it turns out if you put in the mass of the Earth in here, uh, then the, then this would be that, that distance for the Earth, something like this. Like the Earth would be like this big, right? Um, and this is called the Schwarzschild radius. You guys might know this as the event horizon. And it's basically a point of no return, right? Um, let me think. Oh, these are two. And so it applies to anything spherical, not just black holes, because for most things, the, bot, the object itself is bigger than the Schwarzschild radius, right? And if you think about it, fitting the entire Earth inside of this mass, all of the mass of the Earth inside of this, this volume is, is very hard. So you think that these things would never exist, but actually they do. So why is it that black holes exist? I promise we'll like actually talk about orbits, but um, why do black holes exist? Well, if you suppose you had a star in Newtonian mechanics, like uh, it's true that we don't really expect them to exist in Newtonian mechanics. Suppose this is a star, and suppose for some reason or another the star sort of like like fails or something, and then like the star starts collapsing because it doesn't have enough fuel or something. So like get, it sort of crunches down and gets small. But the thing is, because it got small, the pressure actually goes up, and because the pressure goes up to compensate for it getting small, okay. Then it actually gets held up again. And so the star is like sort of crunching more, but it's okay still. That's like in Newtonian mechanics is what happened. Now, so this is Newton. In GR, what happens is you have a star, then it like sort of crunches down, it gets it gets pressure, and so it gets kept up. But here's the problem, okay? And I didn't really mention this before. This is called the stress energy tensor. And it's sort of like, sort of, you can see like, this is, these are sort of the fields, right? Sort of the same concept as here. And then these are the mass, the, this is sort of the mass bit. But this doesn't all, only consider mass, it also considers energy and pressure. So it turns out that pressure itself also experiences gravity, right? And so th if you think about it, like you've increased the pressure, so you're holding up your planet, but by having pressure, you actually increase the amount of gravity. So the more pressure you add, the more gravity you get. And so you sort of have a runaway, Runaway, where like you basically keep adding pressure, but it doesn't help because that just adds more gravity, and then you lose, right? So, so then you end up like continue, co continually collapsing until you get like a, a like a point-like object called a black hole, right? So that's fundamentally why it is that black holes exist, uh, which is interesting. Other uh, other uh, interesting concepts that that come up are this concept of an ISCO. Uh, which is the innermost stable circular orbit. Which is this idea that uh, in Newtonian mechanics, you can have an orbit as close to the sun as you want. Like, obviously not in the sun, but you, know. but you can have, if you have a point like that's very heavy, you can orbit it as close as you want. Uh, but the ISCO is the idea that in general relativity, if you try and orbit too close, you'll actually, there's a radius at which you'll just sort of spiral in, you'll sort of lose control, and you won't be able to really orbit stably at, at that radius. Um, and another concept, so this is one concept, another concept is light can orbit. You can actually have like light that goes around and sort of like gets dragged in a trajectory that makes it go in a circle. Um, okay, that's cool, I guess. Um, perhaps one of the biggest conundrums is something called precession, which comparatively sounds really boring. I've been about this for a very long time. So recall that we 
we'll use that in encoding mechanics. That uh, when you have an elliptical, when you have a circular orbit, that sort of corresponds to you just staying at this point in the potential, right? Uh, and when you have an elliptical orbit, which is sort of an orbit that looks like this, like the, like the kind that Pluto has, the total kind that we have, um, you're sort of gonna have your, your mass is gonna slosh back and forth in this potential. Um, and the rate at which it's gonna go back and forth is actually the same rate as, which, as, as going around, right? And so ultimately you get something like this. Now it turns out in relativity, um, you kind of, uh, that kind of doesn't really happen anymore. Of course it happens like in, in the normal limit. But it turns out that what you'll get is, you'll get an orbit that looks like this. You'll have an elliptical orbit, and then you'll want to close the orbit, but actually you'll sort of like miss, and you'll actually go like this. Like this. So you can see that at any given point, you sort of uh, like think that you're on an elliptical orbit, but actually you're sort of processing, you see. Um, and this happens really, really slowly. I've drawn it to be extremely exaggerated. This is a very small number. Um, but this effect becomes larger for things that orbit closer, and so actually people noticed it for Mercury. The reason why people noticed it, even though it's such a small effect, is that it builds up over time. So like 100 years ago, like somebody probably measured what, like where the, where Venus, or sorry, where Mercury was. And then like later on they measured it again, they're like, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because even though it's a small effect, it builds up. And so people, are, you know, at that time were still, still believing in Newtonian mechanics, and they're like, there must be another planet called Vulcan they used up that very cool name for this planet that doesn't exist. And they're like, well, Vulcan must be like tugging on this planet to make it do this, right? It turns out, no, that doesn't exist. It's because of general relativity. So general relativity actually just got, like, you know, people had already known about precession, so it basically explained precession. And they're pretty elegantly, um, might I add. Okay. This is a bit unfocused, but let me, let me talk about black holes again. Okay. Um, actually, do I want to talk about black holes right now? Maybe not. Um, let's talk about gravitational, no, let's talk about black holes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, want to, I just want to make a quick comment. Um, Einstein didn't believe that a lot of the effects of GR would actually become like observable, which you might expect because I drew this dot, which you probably already forgot about. Um, and you might think it's impossible to get the Earth mass in there, and you would, in a reasonable world, be right. Um, so you would have agreed with Einstein, so congratulations. Um, you agreed with him on the one thing he was wrong about. Um, in the real world, we know that the universe has a ton of what are called stellar mass black holes. These are black holes that when you have a star that, that dies, it basically explodes, and then many of, like, some of those stars, the most heavy of those stars sort of um, like crunch down in their cores in what are called core collapse supernovae, right? And they create like a very heavy, like dead star called a black hole, right? In, in exactly the same way that I described uh, in, the, in this picture, right? Um, in addition, we, we know of a few black holes, um, like sort of like black holes which are sort of like 40 solar masses or so. Or so. Right, which are sort of heavier than stellar mass. You know, this would just be like a very heavy star. Right? We know about these because of LIGO, but we'll get back to that. And then, but the, but the kind that we really knew about first are what are called uh, supermassive black holes. And these were actually discovered like a few decades ago. Um, these are huge. These are like millions of solar masses, billions, tens of billions of solar masses, that kind of thing. Right? These are massive. These like. Basically what they do is they occupy the center of galaxies, right? And, and uh, somehow they get over there. I don't really know how. Um, you can show the stuff at the end. I'm going, I'll, I'll show that stuff at the end. Actually. Okay, cool. And what we did was we actually looked in the sky, like sort of towards where we thought the center of the galaxy was, and we just saw a bunch of stars going around this very small region where there was nothing. We, we just didn't see anything there. We were like, you know, there has to be something because like everything is zooming past it, right? Like, at, at, like literally like, fractions of the speed of light, like or like percentage, percent, percentages of the speed of light, which, which is like, you know, very, very fast. And so you know there has to be something very heavy there. So that's how we first found out like black holes actually existed. That's a fantastic accomplishment, really. So black holes are a real thing. Like we've seen them before. And in fact, we took a picture of one, actually. Um, 
which is the side of um, a physicist, actually, as of late. Let me see if I can erase this. All right, let's talk about lensing. I promise this is better with pictures, but I want to show some at the end. So let's see what we have. So I, I, I believe we did mention like gravitational lensing before at some point, like sort of in passing. But remember the equivalence principle. Now, like suppose you you wake up and this time you're like you you're you're in on the you're in a, you're in an elevator, but you're in on it. So you know that you're actually in space, but on a rocket, right? Uh, that's like sort of accelerating you up. So you feel like there's gravity, but really there isn't. It's sort of just uh, acceleration. And it turns out you're in a very long elevator. So what you do is you have like a laser pointer. And then you sort of shine the laser. Okay. Well, like, what direction? What would the path of the laser be? If you think about it, right? Like, it wouldn't go straight because by the time the light gets over here, the elevator would have moved up, right? So, from your perspective on the elevator, it actually looks like the light is sort of curving down and it hits like lower on, on the elevator than than you think you pointed it, right? So, so from your perspective, it looks like. Um, acceleration caused like like caused the, the laser to go down, which is like you know reasonable. Like that sounds like a very reasonable picture. But recall the equivalence principle actually says there's no way to tell the difference between acceleration and gravity. Okay, so what does that say? Gravity should be to light. Bend it. Okay. Yes, gravity bends light. In case you think this is some abstraction and that we would never see it like Einstein did, uh, we do, actually. And I'll show you some fantastic pictures of it. So um, suppose you have some object like in the sky, and then you have another object behind it somewhere. Okay. It turns out that every object uh, has this thing called an Einstein ring, or every pair of objects has this thing called an Einstein ring, because everything is named after Einstein. Turns out this follows a quadratic um, that looks like this. And you'll, you guys will do a very quick problem on the concept about this. The important thing to know is that this quadratic so it has how many solutions? Two. So, and this is sort of the location <coughs> of your image. So actually, if you have an object here, you won't actually see this object. What you'll see is sort of a little image here and a big image over here. Okay. And so it turns out that even if you can't see the images, you can still see that gravitational lenses make things brighter. Hence, they're like lenses. They're like magnifying glasses. However, gravitational lenses do not focus light. So like normal lenses, what they do is sort of like send light that's traveling perpendicularly or parallelly into like one point called the focal length. But gravitational lenses do not do that. They don't act like normal lenses, actually. And so the best way to, to sort of simulate uh, uh, gravitational lens is by having a wine glass. Um, and basically what you do is you just slide the wine glass over some picture you've drawn on a piece of paper. And, uh, and, and so you, you might see like, well, the wine glass has this like very like spiky thing in the middle. So really, like the lensing becomes very, very, very strong at the center. That's basically um, what gravitational lensing will look like. Okay, now let's talk about gravitational waves. We have 30 minutes, don't we? Oh, we have 30 minutes. just where you think an object is, where you see the object, right? So like if the object were actually there in the sky, oh, where, yeah, if the object were actually here in the sky, but this object is behind <coughs> the one, 
you wouldn't actually see this. What you would see is two images, or two pic you would see the two versions, two copies of the object, one brighter than the other. You see what I mean? We'll show you pictures at the end so you can see exactly how it looks like. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, like, yeah. Or I think, wait, do you um, give context? Like, if there's a background, yeah, like a background object, yeah, yeah. and you have something in the foreground that's really massive, the background object's light will actually bend around the foreground object. And from the Earth's perspective over here, you'll see the light going around the foreground object. And so, so what you see is not, you don't, you don't just see the background object, you see something weird. And uh, we'll show you pictures at the end to prove that. Yeah, there, yeah, so, yes. Uh, yeah, we'll show you these pictures. But for now, let's talk about gravitational waves. So, so in Newtonian gravity, um, I didn't, this wasn't something we explicitly said, but you know, if you're taking physics class, you might you might have heard or you might have assumed that gravity propagates instantly. Okay. So like if I move something here, then like something across the universe can tell that I move this object because the gravity would have changed instantly. Uh, it turns out this is not true. And of course it's not true because um, you might remember that in relativity we should respect in some sense the speed of light. Right? This is still like a, a true concept. Um, and so, uh, in real life, gravity travels less than the speed of light, or so it travels at the speed of light, exactly the speed of light. And in fact, it travels, it actually propagates in waves. And if you think about it, like this is kind of surprising, but it's also not particularly surprising. I mean, we had a field theory that uh, described electromagnetism, and we, and we, you know, even though it was just sort of describing fields, right, we ended up finding that there are actually waves in there. So maybe you shouldn't be so surprised that gravity, it turns out, general relativity also has waves in it, in, in the same sense. And just like normal light, uh, gravity actually has two polarizations. Um, um, what, what, by the way, what, what, what does a gravitational wave really mean? It really means that sort of space is getting uh, stretched and squeezed in some direction, right? In sort of a, like a, an oscillating pattern. So to, to show this, um, suppose I have like some points like this. Like suppose I have like a bunch of like particles like arranged in this fashion. Um, like the what, the what the gravitational wave will do if it's sort of traveling into the board is it will sort of like, okay. Like it will first of all arrange them into a circle and then it will sort of stretch them out in this direction. So like I'll just draw the like draw the shape. So like stretch it out in this direction. So you can see what it's doing, right? It's sort of like stretching and squeezing along these two perpendicular axes, right? And similarly, there's a, like a different polarization which basically looks like this. No, the polarization is like for, like is the direction of the wave. So um, the wave can be going like this or it can be going like this. So that's what we're referring to. And it turns out um, that this seems like it would be kind of hard to detect. In fact, it's a very, very, very subtle effect, right? It's very hard to detect this. So bear this in mind. Um, what's the, how do we discover, how do, so gravitational waves definitely exist. Uh, but the question is, how do we find out about them? Do you guys know? Any ideas? would say this, that's why I asked. Actually, we knew about gravitational waves before then, because nobody talked about those people. <laughs> those people's names were Holt and Taylor. They actually won a Nobel Prize, but I guess people do talk about them. Um, Holt and Taylor, what they did was they looked in the sky and they saw these two objects, or like one object. They saw one object. Um, like They couldn't really tell them apart, I think. But here, here's what the, the object really was, just because you know we have the benefit of we have two, uh, two neutron stars, you know, so like the magnet stars you saw in the prom set, but less magnetic than that. And it turns out magnet, uh, that, that pole stars, or like neutron stars, actually like shoot out beams of light, like this. And so this is us on Earth. And so what was happening is these pole stars were going around each other, right? And sort of like every, every time they went around, every time, every time, so this one was spinning around also by itself. 
So every time this one spun around, the, the beam would sort of hit Earth, and we would see like a pulse. So we would just keep seeing these blinking, this blinking pulse. Exactly like a lighthouse. Yeah, like a lighthouse, exactly. Um, and so you would see them at very regular intervals. Like pulsars are extremely precise. They sort of like are like very, very precise clocks. But the thing was, that actually, like the signals were actually, even though they were coming at like very consistent intervals, right? It actually turned out that some came a little bit later and some came a little bit earlier. So if you plotted it over time, like the delay, it looked like this. And does anyone know why this would be? Any ideas? Yes? Because like these things, like these ones are extremely dense. Like they, every time they rotate around each other, they create these pulses. And That's a good guess. It's very close to the answer. Yes? I was thinking if one, um, if one orbits around the other, then it'll block the other one. That's also here. very close, but that's not the answer either. <laughs> it turns out that it, it is because they're orbiting each other, but the reason why is because when this pulsar is far farther away from us, the light actually takes longer to get to us. So it gets delayed. And when it's closer to us, it gets it comes earlier than expected, right? So that's the reason why. Like, on so the order of like light minutes. Right. So it's like a very short amount of time. Um, but it but it does but it uh, is something that we can measure. And so you know that that doesn't seem like anything particularly weird, but it turns out that Pulse and Tail looked at this thing for a, a very long time, much longer than this, and what they saw was this. Like 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 this should be like roughly the same period, but like it's going down, <coughs> like a downward trend, right? And it turns out the reason that uh, the reason that we, we realized was that like by like going around each other, they actually were creating gravitational waves. Okay. And they were actually emitting gravitational waves, and because they're emitting waves which carry away energy, the, the, orbit, the orbital energy actually decreased, so they're actually getting closer and closer together over time. So we were actually watching these neutron stars spiral into each other um, and seeing the pulses arrive sooner and sooner than we expected, right? which is insane. right? And so it turns out that if you do the math of general relativity, you actually get out like the right answer. Like you predict this rate of decay. And so that's the first way we knew about gravitational waves. But of course, we didn't um, actually detect them. Right? We didn't detect the gravitational waves. We yeah, we didn't saw detect that neutron them. Neutron stars were, were like anomalously spiraling into each other, and we knew something had to give for neutron stars to be like some. They need to be losing energy for them to be spiraling. Into so we were like, where is that energy going? Pulsar Taylor said gravitational waves, but we never detected the gravitational waves directly. Right. So we we had like I would claim that there is ample evidence for gravitational waves, but like like um, like Shashir says, uh, we actually never detected them uh, at that time. Uh, however, later on, uh, as as uh, Nikhil said, uh, we had something called LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. And basically what it did, let me just draw them here so it's, it's more obvious. Well, that, well, so LIGO basically looks like two very long like, uh, like arms, right? Where you basically shine a laser like pointing here and then pointing here, and then you can like very accurately monitor the change in distance. So let me just draw it here so it's obvious. Like let's say LIGO looks like this. It's one arm here and one arm here. What you would see is that one of the arms would look like it's increasing in length and then the other arm is decreasing, and then later on you would sort of see that the other arm gets longer and the, sh the first arm gets shorter. See what I'm saying? So you see like, in principle, if you had an observatory like this, you'd be able to detect gravitational waves. And it turns out they built one, Ray Weiss spent his entire life building this thing, and fortunately for his career, uh, it worked. Uh, although, I mean, he already got a job and stuff. So this led to a Nobel Prize, again, about gravitational waves, led to uh, uh, Ray Weiss, uh, Kip Thorne, who actually was an advisor on the movie Interstellar, and uh, uh, Barry Barish, who was this other guy. Um, yeah, and it, actually one thing that, uh, that should be noted is that general relativity, despite how big of a theory it was, actually never won a Nobel Prize. Because of some politics or something. Yeah, 
And so it turns out that um, up there I told you that there were sort of these 40 solar mass black holes. We actually didn't really know about those black holes until LIGO. Because when LIGO turned on, we saw black holes very, very soon, almost instantly. But the kinds of black holes we saw were not the kinds of black holes we knew about, which were these stellar mass ones. We saw like 40 solar mass black holes colliding with other 40 mass stellar black holes, like making big black holes and stuff like this. Like black holes that were much bigger than we had anticipated seeing, right? Um, and we, we also, you know, uh, saw instances where like neutron stars would actually collide with black holes, uh, where it turns out you can actually uh, detect the gravitational waves, then you can point your telescope in the, so the, the sky where you think that that happened. It turns out that when you have a neutron star getting destroyed by a black hole in this fashion, you actually can see like a burst of light coming from the place that you think it should come from. So we're reasonably certain that these are real. And when I show you the picture, you might agree. Um, yeah. So how is it that black holes form in reality? Well, I already, show, I already told you how like stellar mass black holes form, right? Um, and, the, and so I, I'm sort of telling you this because I sort of want you to have a picture for like what, what we expect to see with this thing. Yes? Uh, I was kind of confused on the size of uh, black holes. So do yeah. they have the same density? Um, so they don't, so like uh, in the general relativistic model, they're actually like point masses. They're like points. They're, they're, they have a singularity, right? So like literally all the mass is in one point, and the only reason we see them as like holes is because there's a short scale radius. Remember we discussed the short scale radius? So at that distance, light itself can't escape, so we just see like a hole in space. But the, all of the mass itself is concentrated into one point. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean like formally, we like, I didn't mention this, but when you fall into a black hole, maybe we can talk about it during section. You never come out of a black hole. You will show this on your problem set, and it'll be very satisfying when you show it, right? Um, once you go to a black hole past the event horizon, there's no coming out, right? Maybe you remember this from Interstellar if you've watched it. Um, although he does come out, so maybe they should fire whoever made it. Um, although he won a Nobel Prize, so I guess you could fire me. <laughs> okay. um, how do black holes get created? Well, I told you there are these things called chloroplast supernovae. This only applies to the most massive stars, by the way. What happens is you have a star, it sort of collapses inward, then like the core gets really, really dense, and it sends a shockwave through the rest of the star, just like blowing off the rest of the star. So you get like, boom. And then you, and you're left with like a, like a little black hole. Like little meaning like a few solar masses. We should dis uh, dispel some misconceptions about black holes first. They don't like they don't pull more than like other objects of their same mass. If you have like a two solar mass black hole, it'll pull the same amount as as a star that's two times the mass of the sun. Yeah. So if the mass is bigger, you have like a bigger event horizon, right? Yeah, that's true. In fact, the thing is like you won't be able to like if you're outside of where the black hole would be, you actually can't really tell the difference. Like if you're out, if you're far away from the black hole, it looks just like anything else. It's only when you get really close to the black hole that it starts to behave differently from what you would expect other things to behave like, mm -hmm. right? Well, the same. So, uh, like so for example, if we replace, yes. Like say the sun just became a black hole right now. You would not notice, except that the entire really sky would be dark. Yeah. But otherwise, like gravity would like behave the same way. The orbits will still be going. Yes, yes, exactly. They would not. They would not change. But you'd be able to get a lot closer to the sun. If you tried shooting a rocket towards the sun, as the rocket got closer and closer to the sun, like it would start behaving very strangely, and at some point it would like totally do weird things. So. Yes. So when you have a dying star, actually Shashir and Shashank for the Astro Lecture will tell you about other kinds of dying stars, which are also really insane. But um, but for the most massive stars, you'll get something called core collapse uh, supernovae. Uh, which is like I said, basically you have the star it sort of crunches in, the core becomes very, very dense, and then the outer layers get blown off in like an explosion. This will give you like a few solar masses. Turns out that if you make your star even bigger than that, you'll get something called a pair instability supernova. Which is where the energy is involved inside uh, your your the, the energies in like in, like involved within the star become so massive that they actually start generating particles. 
which decreases the pressure, causing a shockwave so the entire star explodes and leaves nothing behind. Which is kind of weird, right? Like, you would expect like the bigger star to sort of leave more behind, like a bigger mass black hole or something, but actually it leaves nothing. And then if you, uh, if you make it even bigger than this, then what you'll get is a direct collapse. And notice how I don't write supernova because there's no explosion. It literally just is so massive that the entire thing just becomes a black hole. So star, black hole, with no explosion. Right? And so the, those, star, those, solid, those, those uh, black holes tend to be very, very big, right? Because precisely because none of the layer, none of the outer layers get, get blown off. It just all goes into the black hole. And so um, it turns out that if you ever if you ever follow LIGO news, people will talk about like the mass gap. And um, there there are two meanings to this, but one of the meanings is um, like that there isn't a black hole, like there aren't black holes like in between these two masses, right? Um, and that's that's what is meant by that is one that is one interpretation of what is meant by that. Um, okay. And before we show the slides, I just want to talk about one quick other thing. Um, in electromagnetism, we had Maxwell's equations. And whenever Maxwell's equation said something, we sort of believed it to be like true, like to be reality. See, but the, but, so basically, anything that solves Maxwell's equation, we sort of believe is a real thing that could actually happen. In general relativity, we would like for that to be the case, but it, but we can't really say that for certain, right? There are like it turns out general relativity predicts the existence of a lot of random things, which um, don't necessarily exist, but they could. So in particular, so let me write down exotic solutions. Um, it turns out that there there are, there's a solution called an Einstein-Rosen bridge. You guys heard of this before? Um, I think people usually call it a wormhole, <laughs> which is basically when you have like, like two like two portions of space time which are connected by like this tunnel, where there's like a black hole on one side and, and a white hole on the other side, right? Uh, and it turns out that uh, like wormholes of this kind actually um, will snap shut before you can travel through them, um, and we actually don't know that these exist. So. Maybe these don't, probably these don't exist, but maybe they do. I don't, I don't know, you can ask whoever you want, they'll give you different answers. <laughs> and it, and it, it was actually shown that if you had ne such, such a thing as negative mass, that you could actually hold one open, um, which is strange. Uh, it's, it's yet to be seen whether such a concept as negative mass actually exists. Um, but if it did, that would be kind of insane. Um, but think about the implications of this, right? Like you, it, when you go through the wormhole, you, it wouldn't seem like you were sort of traveling faster than the speed of light because you would sort of be following like a straight line path through space time. But to people who didn't know about this wormhole, you'd be looking like you were just instantaneously traveling from place to place. Um, and this is sort of uh, sort of a, an example of a more general kind of thing called a closed time-like curve, which is very problematic uh, in general relativity. Which is basically this idea, it's basically time travel, right? It's basically this idea that, you guys remember the concept of the light cone from discussion? Like, everything that you could influence in the future? Like, a closed time light curve basically occurs, like, when, uh, like, your light cone sort of, like, intersects itself, so it, like, sort of loops around. And, you know, people sort of misrepresent the way that this act would actually work, or, like, with the way the theory says this would actually work. People sort of think you could go back in time and kill your grandfather or something. No, what actually happens is even worse. Uh, what actually happens is you would sort of basically, so what the way you should think about general relativity, right, and this is the thing that people miss, is general relativity is basically a theory about space-time as like a geometric object, like it's a, an object. It's not a thing that's evolving in time. Time is just another direction on this object, right? Uh, and so it's not like you could go back in time and sort of like change the path because that's sort of like not consistent with the shape of the object, right? What's, what would actually happen is that you would sort of go back in time, you would sort of go in a circle back in time, and then you would repeat the exact same thing that you, um, like with no ability, no free will, no ability to change it. Now whether or not closed time like curves exist, of course this is like a very, like, like controversial thing, right? It certainly it solves, Maxwell's, uh, solves uh, Einstein's field equations, right? Uh, 
in some very exotic regime, uh, but we've of course never seen one, uh, otherwise I would win a Nobel Prize. Um, and I don't deserve one, so I claim that such a thing is not possible. Um, but it turns out that there are sort of other exotic examples of things that could cause closed time like curves. For example, it turns out someone proved that if you have like an infinitely long cylinder, like literally infinitely long, and it rotated at a certain rate that you would you cause this. If you have a spinning black hole, there are parts of the spinning black hole which are supposed to cause that too. Um, I'll show a picture of that. Um, unfortunately, that region is inside the black hole, so good luck. Okay. So now for the last two minutes, let's just talk about like, let's just review a bunch of pictures. This is not a very good picture, actually. This is um, the whole Taylor pulsar system, right? So you can see the idea uh, is essentially that um, what's being shown here is sort of uh, like, I guess the time delay, right? So you can see that it sort of uh, decays over time. So the spiral is going to keep changing. Yeah. So, like, so by measuring this thing, you notice. By the way, this, this curve right here is like a prediction. And I think it has error bars. Yeah, it has error bars on it. So. But you can't see them because they're so small. We're right on them. If you, like, look really closely, you can see them. Um, so, so, needless to say, we think general relativity is probably true, which is why all of these other weird solutions are kind of scary. Um, here's another picture I wanted to show, which is basically, oh, this is so small. Um, this is basically the regime of, um, of different kinds of uh, things seen by LIGO, or different kinds of gravitational wave emitters, right? So it turns out LIGO actually only sees like bl two black holes, like right when they're about to converge, and they're spinning around each other super, super fast. But it turns out that we're trying to build this other instrument <coughs> like that will take flight in like 15 years, called LISA. Which is basically what we're going to do is we're going to have three like like satellites like follow behind the Earth uh, and like be its own gravitational wave observatory, so like in space, and it would actually be able to detect um, like black holes that are orbiting orbiting each other like very far away from each other, like like in minutes or days or those kinds of things. And so and so this picture I can post these slides. This picture sort of shows uh, where what kind of uh, what kind of gravitational waves you could detect. So you can see LIGO is sort of like all the way down here only detecting the very end of mergers, whereas Lisa would actually be able to see black holes long before they merge. So it's like, cool. What's going on? Um, oh, that was actually the end of the presentation. Okay, well I showed you the end of that. Um, wow, okay, that, this is the same plot as before. Um, this is a, a picture of a bunch of stars orbiting the uh, galactic center. This is, of course, like not a real picture. This is sort of a cartoon. We can see that um, these stars, these are all like star like orbits that we sort of like uh, reconstructed, and we can see that there's like this op there's like this center point where everything is orbiting. But we can't see the thing here. It's actually invisible. Um, this is just a picture of different kinds of GR tests that we've done. Okay, so this is a video. This is an actual like these are actual images that we've taken okay. over many years. You see it? So these stars are orbiting so fast that you can calculate that whatever object is there must be ridiculously massive, like mind-bogglingly massive. And you might wonder why it becomes fuzzy and clear all of a sudden. That's just because we sort of uh, inc improved our instrumentation. This is a, these are real images, right? And so you can see, of course, I'll play it again because it's so amazing. There's nothing here. Like, what else could it be, right? Um, it turns out that people, this, this central most star, which is the one that I pay most attention to, we've actually uh, watched it for more than an entire orbit, because it actually orbits so quickly. And, uh, oh, God, okay. Um, and so it turns out that uh, there's an effect called gravitational redshift, which is sort of like, turns out that stars that are farther in the uh, gravitational potential of something actually like emit light, which we observe to be redder. Um, and that will actually play a big role in cosmology. So let me just postpone that. Yes? Was that star that was orbiting, was that real time? Uh, that's not real time. No, it, so this, this would so be over like years. tens of years. Oh. So this was like starting in like the 1990s. But these are like, this is at the center of our galaxy, which is so far away. So you can imagine that these distances that the star is traveling over are Huge. immense. Right? Like, so th like, this is like inter, in like, like the space between stars. This is like massive distances. The fact that like we can observe it on a human lifetime 
means these are traveling at very like percentages of the speed of light. They're very, they're moving very fast. This is a picture of a real black hole. Hopefully now you can see why we're so excited. It's sort of the same situation with gravitational waves. We just never took a picture of a black hole. We only sort of, you know, indirectly showed, showed that they existed. This black hole is not the black hole at the center of our galaxy. It's actually a much bigger one in a different galaxy uh, because ours has like, like problems with observing or something. This is what's called a Kerr black hole, right? So I, I so we sort of discussed like the, the short show black hole, which is basically like a circular black hole. If the black hole rotates, it turns out it doesn't, it's not a singularity anymore. It doesn't have a point. It actually has a ringularity. <laughs> so this is a real thing. So it has like a circle, like, and then it turns out that like, if you go through the circle, like there are closed time like curves or something. There are also regions of the, like that are not within the event horizon called the ergosphere. So if you're in the ergosphere, it turns out that you're like, by physics, you're not allowed to like, like stop. You must follow, you, you can't stop. You must follow like the rotation of the black hole, otherwise otherwise nothing, you just can't, like by physics. Like, it, like physics just doesn't let you stop. Um, this, is, this is sort of a, a, simula a ray tracing simulation of a, a, a black hole that's rotating. You can see, this is not a real picture, but like this would be sort of what it would look like, with the exception that um, it's not, I don't think this picture is showing like the redshift, so it doesn't actually show like how much redder the light would be, just where it would go. But like this is sort of like an idea of what it might look like. This is these are real pictures of gravitational lensing. So these so the, the curved objects are are galaxies way in the background. The object in the so the first picture, the object in the center, is is a foreground. It's like, in the front. So it's in the front. This blue thing is in behind, but the light sort of like traveling, getting warped around the object. You can see that it warps into this like circle. This is like another picture called the Cheshire Smile or Cheshire Cat or something. Uh, and you can see that these are, this is like the galaxy that's just behind those like lenses. Galaxy is obviously Thing here, here, thing here. Um, and so you, these are, like I said, real pictures. You can like see these, right? Like with Hubble and stuff. And so this is, this is pretty cool. Turns out, like I said, even if you can't actually see the images, you can still see things get brighter uh, which, uh, in a very characteristic way. So you see things like this. So for example, if you have two, uh, two stars orbiting each other, they, they become a lens, so they pass in front of something. Turns out they cause two spikes in the light called caustics, right? And so you, what you'll do is you'll uh, look in the sky, you'll see a star and it'll just like, like become really bright and then like become really bright again, right? And it turns out that um, you can also use it to detect planets. So if you have a planet and the planet sort of like, if a system with a planet like passes in front of another like star, right? The other, the planet will sort of become its own lens and it will sort of like make a little dip on top of the big dip caused by the star. That's called like micro lensing. And, uh, and yeah. I think we'll talk about that more in the after lecture. Yeah, Th these are just polarizations of gravitational waves. Um, I already showed this picture. I don't, I wonder if there's sound. I think there isn't. Um, because this is not hooked up. Oh, it does actually. It does. So the insane thing about um, about LIGO, right, is that we actually built multiple gravitational wave detectors. In fact, in the US alone, we built two. We built one in Hanford and one in Livingston. And the fact that they both see the, the identical signal at the same time means that like we're pretty sure that it isn't noise, right? And in fact, the sound you've heard is actually, if they took the frequency of the gravitational wave, they converted it to sound and they played it. You could, it's actually in like frequencies that you could hear. So once again. It sounds like this, and if you if you go on Twitter and you follow like at LIGO, they actually like like they make a tweet every time they think they see something, which is like every like a lot. They they see it a lot. <laughs> uh, but not all of them are, are real. Yeah. <laughs> but this one is almost like certainly a real. Yeah, and then so that's it. So that's basically uh, everything. Anyone have any questions? It's been it, it was a lot, but um, basically this is what gravity, I claim, really is. Right, a fake force that has a lot of counterintuitive consequences. Yeah. yeah so how does LIGO um, detect gravitational waves? Right, so like I said, um, LIGO is basically a building that has two long arms. Like miles and miles long. There's one in Washington. Yeah. So uh, the idea is that, we, like, let me just go back to the, the slide. So imagine that one arm is this way and one arm is this way. And you can see that one of the arms is actually gonna get shorter and then longer and shorter again. And then the other 
arm is actually going to also get longer and shorter, right? Because of like this, because the space like between the arms actually getting contracted and expanded in an oscillating fashion. So the amount by by which like why don't why don't we see that happening? Like why don't we just see like why don't I see Leon getting like like shorter and longer or whatever like as a gravitational wave passes by? It's because this effect is literally on the order of like like fractions of the width of a proton. So yeah yeah it's like I think the yeah the distance even for like LIGO would be like I think a thousandth the width of a proton, and they I think an amusing anecdote was something along the lines of. At first, they built LIGO, and then suddenly the Raspberry motorcycle outside, and they could detect it. So they're like, we can't do that. So then they, they like made it more. They made it like, like they insulated it more, so it wouldn't be sensitive to that. And then they like detected thunderstorms in Africa, and they're like, we can't, we can't. This is not okay. So then they like, they got rid of that. And then currently, I've been told that like the the, the like limiting the limiting um, thing on like how sensitive LIGO can be is actually the material that they're like mirrors are coated with or something like this, like it's that sensitive. Because there's quantum mechanics. We'll, we'll get to that more later. <laughs> but yeah, that is the really yeah. Yeah. Could we theoretically be hit with a gravitational wave so significant that I would look different to you for a moment from here? No. Or that you could physically feel it? Uh, just because it's like, it's a very small effect and anything that could cause gravitational waves that we would care about are just really far away. So yeah, we so would, like black we would, we would never see it. Like these black holes are merging in galaxies that are like extremely, extremely distant from right. us. Right, not even our own galaxy, like other galaxies. Yeah, yeah. Like very far away. Like we can't, like most of the time, we can't even pinpoint exactly what's going on. And so just like light, gravitational waves spread in all directions. So just like light, they get weaker and weaker as you go away from the source. And so if you're trying to detect something in a galaxy that distant, it's going to be extremely weak by the time it comes to the Earth. And so that's why we really have to struggle. Which is why it's fantastic we can detect it at yeah. all. Yes. Well, how about it's like two like separate things which are propagating waves and then they collide? Like the waves. Yeah, so they just like normal waves, they actually will like interfere. So like like yeah, so that they like they're in phase and they'll actually become a bigger wave. And if they're like out of phase, they'll cancel each other out. In, in theory we could detect that, but we have like it's it's like Gravitational wave events don't occur that frequently, and so like we haven't really observed two gravitational wave events occurring at the same time. I also don't know what would happen. But actually, it won't be happening with things that are like right in that area, right? They, like they would just have like a slightly <laughs> higher, like they would they would be squeezed and stretched slightly more than you'd expect if, like for example, the waves were aligned so that there's constructive interference, and if there's disruptive, it's just less. So we'll yeah. get. More on more on that in, in like I think quantum mechanics is really trouble with waves. It's the confusion of constructive and disruptive interference. Yeah. Any other questions? I mean, like you're free to go, obviously, um, but you know, feel free to stick around if you if you have anything you want to ask. Um, like the fact that you guys believe me so readily is like very scary. <laughs> yeah, I could be telling you anything. Um, but fortunately for you, this is actually true. So. Cover more. Cool black hole stuff and uh, gravitational wave stuff in the discussion.